Hey everybody, Professor Snart checking in as we continue to move through our creative writing course, getting a little deeper into the actual writing part of it. So I'm just looking at our due dates here. We're finishing up <clears throat> Unit 2, which had a couple of different assignments, um, kind of about maybe the technique of writing and the framing a memory idea, but also then a little bit broader in, uh, in terms of like what motivates us to write as individuals, but also kind of like culturally or historically why have we done it or why do we continue to do it? Why do we want to share, tell and share stories with one another? Um, okay, so I'm just going to pop into unit two really quickly then. Oops. So the rules of creative writing. So you'll find that as a link over in our main course page or our main uh, course menu. Since I'm hoping that it's something that you can refer back to um, throughout the writing that we're doing, because it really applies, you know, broadly across all the genres that we're doing. It's a little narrated slideshow, so you can play it, you can listen to the little narrated pieces. The audio is not so good just because the way the, the program works, it tries to keep the file size kind of smaller, so the audio is not that terrific. But you'll hopefully get the idea. So the one thing that I want you to, to tell you kind of generally about those rules is that I've created and narrated the slideshow, obviously. And so you might think or, or maybe wonder if this is just kind of like my take on creative writing. Are these professional industry standards or how does that exactly work in the world of writing, which can be to some people pretty subjective, just like other art forms are. Um, and so it's kind of a, it's a middle ground, but to be honest with you, it shades less to the purely subjective and this is just how I like it done sort of a thing and really more to, for lack of a better term, a professional standard. In other words, if you asked most working, published, creative writers or creative writing teachers, they would probably agree in whole or in part with most of what we're presenting here. Not that they would agree with me personally, but they'd agree with the idea because it's sort of like generally accepted. Um, and so a lot of it has to do really fundamentally with like thinking of yourself as a writer. And in the context of our course, not writing really for your own pleasure or just to express an emotion like you're frustrated, you want to get that out, you're happy, you want to get that out. That's that therapeutic kind of writing. We really need to be thinking about writing for an audience. Even if you truthfully have no interest in publishing, although I bet some of you do or you will once we get a little further on, um, you really need to be creating, to creating work that is going to be interesting to a reader who doesn't really know you or has no personal investment in what you've written right? The, the thing didn't happen to them and they don't know you or your family. There's no history there. Um, because what that forces you to do is pay attention to the craft of writing. It can't just, you can't just tell a story about yourself and then expect someone who doesn't know you to be like emotionally invested. Obviously, if you give it to your friend or your mom or whatever, they're going to care because it's you, right? They may be a good critic, but probably not, to be honest with you. Um, you have to make that work interesting and exciting and engaging to somebody who has otherwise no connection with you. I mean, truth be told, we do sort of have a connection with each, with each other in the class, and that'll develop as we go. But again, the theory of it is that you'd be writing for someone who's going to pick up a literary journal in Portland, Oregon, and read your work. So you're not there to explain it. They have no connection to you, so they're not going to be emotionally invested it's really the use of language that's going to be interesting. Another thing that's kind of related to this, and it'll show up, I think, a little bit later as we do some of the um, bigger writing assignments, and it's not really part of the slideshow directly, is that oftentimes people, I mean, maybe it's part of that uh, don't solve the problems of the universe type of thing, like the scope of what you're doing. A lot of people get suckered into um, feeling that they don't have a lot of writing craft to fall back on, but they need to make this interesting to somebody who doesn't know them. So they tend to write things that are really overly dramatic. So we get, for a while we got a lot of vampires, now we get a lot of zombies, something explodes, somebody dies, it's apocalyptic, right? It's like big, it's like half of the movies that you go and see now. The dialogue is horrifyingly bad, but dang, but it's, you know, amazing to look at on the screen. So I think we we don't trust ourselves to write a good story, so then somebody has to be a zombie, or there has to be a trick ending, or, you know, fill in the blank, right? So the challenge for you is really not to fall into that trap, to tell a story that's not kind of genre-based, or, or like you'd see on the Hollywood big screen necessarily, but one that depends on 
and, um, and trusts its own use of language to be interesting. Again, this is jumping a little bit ahead, but um, I think I'd throw that into the set of rules or ideas that are meant to be our guiding principle as we move through this course. Okay, back to our units here. So in unit two, you did that framing a memory exercise, which is precisely about what I just talked about. You can't just tell a story about you and expect me to care because I know you. I mean, I would, obviously, but you need to tell it in a way that uses language uh, that's going to engage me, that's going to be interesting, that's going to draw me in, not just because it's this either hyperbolically dramatic story or because I know you, even just as a student right online. Um, you can't depend on that to be the sort of hook that draws me in. And then the discussion board, the why I write, is I think an interesting reflection for you to do, but also it's sort of cool to see um, this, uh, the National Writing Project site on YouTube where, you know, thousands or whatever people have reflected on this same question. So of course indivi or, um, responses will be individual, but it's interesting to place those individual reflections into that larger kind of social or cultural scene. I also invite you to do video posts for this, which is something that might figure throughout the course. So I hope some, uh, some people will take that up. Okay, so let's look at our next units. And these get us a little more specifically into um, uh, some of the concepts we want to cover for, uh, for our creative writing class here. All right, so this is a fun one. Here we're looking at the literary devices that are all related like simile, metaphor, analogy, basically like the comparison idea, comparison of two seemingly dissimilar things. And it's ironically that dissimilarity that makes a simile really great. It's not if you take things that are basically alike already and everyone can see that, and then you compare them, that's not so interesting, but it's, it's the surprise we get of when you as a writer use language in a way that compares two things that we otherwise never might have thought about as similar. It's that moment of surprise that like hooks us in and really engages us. So there's a funny clip here from uh, an old movie called Renaissance Man where Danny DeVito explains what these are. I think you already know, but hey, it's cool to see it in the movies, right? And then everybody either knows or has seen this one too from Forrest Gump, Life is uh, Like a Box of Chocolate. Okay, like I say in the assignment, it's actually a pretty good metaphor, but it's so kind of now a little bit corny <laughs> because of the, its existence in the movie and all that stuff. So there's a whole bunch of baggage wrapped around it, but it's a great way of explaining how simile metaphor uh, work. In this case, it's a simile because it use, it's the comparison using like or as. So the assignment here is, I think, a really good one. <laughs> there you go. So all I'm asking you to do is to find, yeah, a uh, metaphor analogy, simile. Similes tend to be the easiest ones to spot because they use like or as, so they really stand out as a comparison. But, and this is the part that I like about it, I'm not just asking you to tell me what it is or tell us what it is, I'm asking you to actually think about it in terms of this formula here. So again, life is like a box of chocolates is a really good one because it plugs right into this formula and really shows one way in which simile can be really, really powerful. So it takes an abstract thing, a thing that's really hard to think about because it's big and it's, you can't hold it and it's just like this kind of unmanageable idea, but compares it to something that's otherwise pretty mundane. It's a physical object. In this case, in this example, it's even like small and fits in your hand. So it makes this big, almost unthinkable thing sort of like thinkable, approachable. We can imagine it and think about it by making the analogy to this very mundane or concrete thing. So that's what I want you to do with the example that you find. Don't just tell, it, tell us what it is, but actually plug it into the formula so you really see how it works. The other little piece to this is that I don't want you to just Google simile and like take whatever it gives you, that's lame. Um, do the work of pulling a book off your shelf or listening to music that you've got or whatever. Um, and, and listen for, for how these are working in situ or in their actual context. Again, don't just Google something and let it spit an answer at you in a quarter of a second or whatever it takes. And then, oh, that's the, meta, that's the simile you all, all of a sudden love. Don't do that. Find one from something that you're already kind of interested in. Plug it into the formula, explain to us how it works, and then as always, be sure you're doing this response part of the posts as well, or of the post as well. Okay. So quickly back to our due dates, because what we'll see is that 
in an effort to give ourselves a little more time as we work towards our first workshop, which is coming up relatively soon in the context of how fast we move, we're actually doing units two or three and four due on the same date. It gives you a little bit more time to be working on this uh, short story, which you should be having in the, kind of the back of your mind, although I know there's a lot of other stuff going on for us right now. Okay, so we just looked at that simile um, uh, assignment, the metaphor analogy, right, that literary device. And then for unit four, another, I think, pretty fun one. Some ideas about the theory of short stories. It's pretty simple on paper here to look at or on the screen to look at, but it's like, how do you actually make this happen, right? That's the, the hard part. If it was easy, everyone would be a bestseller, but it's clearly not, so we wanna go backwards. So I'm gonna let you work through that. Again, it's very kind of abstract. It's, it's making it happen. That's the challenge. A couple of uh, short stories for you to read. I've tried to embed them here. Sometimes it's just the link that shows up. So there's one from our handbook, but there's another one, uh, an ebook here. And I want you to read for the way in which these short stories subscribe to or maybe deviate from or how they manipulate that theoretical idea of how stories work that's presented here. They have this kind of rising action, this climactic moment, the kind of thing that happens, and then the falling action. And you'll see that it's presented here as a pretty symmetrical pyramid, but depending on when this climactic thing happens, it could be much more over at the start, that turning point. It could be right at the end and there's hardly any falling action. It just sort of ends and we're left to wonder what's going on. Um, but it's important that your stories have all of these parts, maybe not perfectly symmetrical like that, but you should be aware of kind of the, the it's not even organization so much as like narrative flow or pacing of the thing. Okay, but here's the assignment. All right, a tchotchke, a little thing, a trinket, a, a dust collector, right? We all probably have these, don't lie, I know that you do. We're gonna write about them, but we're gonna do so following the model that's provided by this really interesting book called Significant Objects. And so the premise of the book was to take these otherwise valueless things, like this little guy or these little things, and have authors, some of them famous, some of them you've probably never heard of, write completely fictitious backstories for them, so completely made up, um, and then sell them on eBay and see how much money, how much value they could be given. Now, it was completely above board in as much as they... I mean, most of the backstories were so wild that nobody, I think, reasonably would think they were true, but they were also very forthright about it. these were written by authors, they were made up, they're part of this project, so there's like other reasons that they probably took on value, like if the author's famous enough, then somebody wants to own the thing and blah, blah, blah. But it's kind of an interesting thought experiment in, uh, in how our work as a writer telling a story can imbue an otherwise kind of like meaningless object with meaning. And again, think about this. If I own this and it was given to me by my mother on some vacation that we were on, like a family thing, then it has personal value to me. Okay, so that's value of sort. But what your job then is to tell a backstory about it that's going to make it interesting to somebody else who doesn't have, have that same emotional attachment to it. So you can't just write a backstory that says, well, my mother gave me this and I really like my mom, so duh, $10, please that's not gonna work. It has to be much more inventive than that. So you can uh, listen to the audio, which is where I first ran into the book here. Again, because of some browser issues, it doesn't show up nicely, so you can follow the, uh, the link here. But you also have to, you have to, have to, follow the link to the Significant Objects website and read a few of the examples there. The one that I linked to here is a really good one because it's so like inventive and far-fetched and it tells this really pretty big story in a very, very succinct way, so really good use of language. Um, and it also pays attention to lots of the little nuances of the object itself. It doesn't, it doesn't just kind of talk about it abstractly. There's lots of reference to specific details of the object. So that's your job. Your job is to find a tchotchke that you actually own and can hold in your hand. Don't just Google something, it has to be something that you can look at and turn around and feel and know the size of and the texture and all of those details and then tell us a story, a short one, about its history, completely fictitious, that's going to make it have value for us.
pretty cool. You'll, you'll, you'll likely enjoy it. Respond to two other posts, and that will take care of units um, three and four. Okay, that's a lot. If you have any questions, be in touch with me, and I'll talk with everybody soon.